Take your Bibles, turn to Mark 12, verse 28. How many of you love Christmas? Raise your hand if you love Christmas. How many of you don't like it so much? Yeah, there's always the person that understands that all the craziness at Christmas, but it's not that you don't like Jesus, but I get it, you know. But I love Christmas because that's when Jesus decided to come and God gave his son, he entered into a very sin, very dark world to become a man. Without Christmas, there is no Easter. I think it's the greatest advent ever that light has shone into the darkness and it's Jesus Christ, the awesome one, who has come knowing he's gonna die for our sins. And then, of course, Easter. How many of you like Easter? You know, hey, can I just get on you a little bit about Easter? I know I'm a fuddy-duddy, but gifts are okay for Christmas, but Easter? Are you giving, like, big packages and gifts to your kids? Because you're like that. Okay, i just stop right there. That's not in my notes. It's just a little, a little crazy, you know. Um, now, I'm, I'm okay with eating jelly bellies, though. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that, that works. But uh, um, how many of you love your, love your family? Hmm? You love your family? How many of you love your church family? How many of you love your pastors? How many of you love only 10 out of the 11 pastors? <laughs> two of you. <laughs> At least two. I understand that, too. And uh, how many of you love to worship God? Uh -huh. How many of you love the music? Didn't our people play nice music today? It was wonderful. I like that new song. Love changes everything. That's what I'm preaching about. It does change everything. In fact, I don't know, Keith Green, how many of how many, you, he was the first Christian rock guy. Keith Green, he was like cutting edge. Pretty good music was his label. And he did this song. He said, you put this love in my heart. Dun, 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 dun. How many of you heard that? The rest of you are pretty square. Don, Don Hawkins. You're old enough to have known Keith Green. You don't know that song? No, I'll pray for you, brother. It's okay. You just, you just keep wearing your silk little hankies over there, and I'll teach you about this other stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, because God puts love in your heart. You know, you're even born with that capability to love. That's a gift from God. But the Holy Spirit puts love in your heart like you can't believe it. And that's what we need, guys. We need more love. You know, I think what marks this church and you as a people is that you love, you love people. You're loving. You're responsive to the needs of people. You're caring. Love matters, guys. The love for God, the love for his people, the love for the world, it matters. And today I want to talk to you about love a little bit and how does one love God who they have not seen and yet they love him. Mark 12, 28 to 31 says, one of the teachers of the law. Notice it was a teacher of the law that came and heard them debating. Notice it was a teacher of the law, and they were talking and debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? <clears throat> the most important one. And answer Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no commandment greater than these. I pray, Father, help me by your spirit speak what you want us to hear today. Right now in this service, every person, help me, God, that your spirit quicken the words to pierce our hearts and may we be open to be challenged about loving you more, God or the level of love that we have for you, God, and for others. In Jesus we pray, amen. <clears throat> so this, this Mark 12, when he gives this, when the teacher of the law asks this question, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 law, the teacher of the law then asks Jesus, trying to make himself feel good. He says, well, who, who is our neighbor? Well, see, for the Israelites, ne the neighbors were uh, each other. I mean, there was a lot of racism. I hate racism. Do you know that? I hate it. God hates it. But for, for, for the Israelites, they were God's chosen seed. And so no one else mattered. And so their neighbor was the other Israelites. Either you were an Israelite or you were converted Jew, a converted Israelite, and then you could be considered neighbor. But Jesus took it differently here 
because now he's taken it to a point of everyone is your neighbor, every person, because he tells a story out of this question. He says, well, who is your neighbor? And Jesus begins to tell the story of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, in Bible days, those from Samaria were looked down upon as dogs. I mean, there was a prejudice against them. They were nobodies. And, you know, remember, the big issue was the woman at the well that Jesus met, for instance. But in this case, he tells this little story, and he says there's a man that gets taken and beaten and left laying there. They robbed him, took all of his money, and he's laying there, and he's hurt. And then the uh, rabbi walks by, and he doesn't do anything. And then I don't remember who all else walked by, but the different ones walked by. But then this person from Samaria walked by, and took care of him, took him and gave money to an innkeeper and gave, took care of food and took care of watching over him and gave extra money. He said, if there's any more expenses when I come back, I'll pay for them. And he says, that was the one. Who do you think the neighbor was? It was the Samaritan. So what he's saying is that people in need and people all around you are your neighbors. And then I think of this incredible statement to love your neighbor as yourself. If you think that's hard, how about loving your enemies and praying for those that use you? Jesus says that in the Sermon on the Mount. But loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's the problem. A lot of people can't love other people because they can't love themselves. See, God wants you to love yourself in a healthy way. Love yourself doesn't mean selfish. It doesn't mean you become, come before everybody, but you love yourself because God has given you life as a gift and you love yourself because you see God in you and it's okay to love yourself. It's not that you don't love yourself, it's just that you love others as you love yourself. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, some sort of secular uh, you know, humanism or anything like that, that's not what I'm saying. But, but uh, you know, if a person, is unforgiving of themselves, if they don't like themselves, if they think they're no good, then they reflect that on other people. If they're not healthy themselves, they have no love to give. You understand that? So, so people that, that are like that, sometimes they compare themselves among themselves, and then that's unhealthy because you either feel like you're better or you're not as good. Or if you're having in a relationship with other people, if you're unhealthy with, with yourself, if you're unhealthy in the relationship with yourself, then you're, you're jealous or you're, or you're angry or you, or you, you know, can't love someone else who's not okay. Jesus, you know, Jesus loved people not after they got good, but while they weren't good, while they were unlikable and unlovable. You know, I love people that are unlikable. How many of you lo love me a little bit? You don't? Okay. But listen, <clears throat> listen, I'm not always likable. Who said that? <laughs> would, you, would the culprit please step forward? <laughs> Amen, he says. But you're not always likable. Right? We're all unlikable, but God loves us. And listen, listen, you're, you're to love another person as you love yourself. If God wasn't okay with you loving yourself or caring about yourself, you know, then he wouldn't give that, that picture. So you have to become healthy in, in your spirituality, in your relationship. And guess what? You'll never be healthy outside of God. You'll be, never be healthy outside of God's truth and taking that truth, making it powerful in you by his spirit. You're never going to be healthy. And so you, we have to be healthy, healthy to love each other and to love God. How can a person love someone they haven't seen? I asked that question to someone, and they said, what, I've seen God right here. In fact, there's love letters in here from God. I, I think there are people in the Bible that, that saw God. I mean, I think I remember right. Stephen was being stoned. He looked up and saw the Lord, Right? And I, I tell you what, God will reveal himself. He's not shy about revealing himself to you. And he'll put that spirit and that love in you and that power in you beyond measure. And <clears throat> I've I'm, I'm got a little bit of a rasp in his ear, so just forgive me for that. But, you know, sometimes we think about love as being like a person that's uh, like a hero in a movie or, a, or you love the Packers or you love this or love that. And that's not what I'm talking about. I love Kim Mulkey. How many of you know who Kim Mulkey is? Kim Mulkey's the women's basketball coach at Baylor. <clears throat> She's a great woman. She's took 
thousands and thousands of dollars and joined with HEB in Waco and sent $36,000 worth of school supplies down to Louisiana to those school districts that lost everything to help these kids. And she's a wonderful person. She cares about her students. And the greatest achievement for her is for one of her student athletes to graduate and to become a good person. And I, I'll just tell you, I don't know her. I mean, I kind of know her. She, we, we email back and forth because she puts up with me. That's another reason I like her. And, and, but I don't really, but I, I love her. But that's not what I'm talking about, love. I'm talking about loving God differently and you don't, while you don't see God, let me tell you something, you can't love someone until you really get to know them, and then you can love them. But I want, the first thing I want you to see about this is love goes beyond mere feelings. Let me ask you a question. What would people say that you love if they followed you around 24 seven? If they heard every word, they saw everything you did, what you did with your time, what you did with your money, what you did with your energy, <clears throat> what you did with your talents, what you did with your attention, with your enthusiasm, in your thoughts, if they knew them all the time, what would they say to you what you love? Would they say you loved your smartphone? I saw in one of the floods, a woman walking out, the water's up there, and she's got her smartphone in her mouth, walking out of the flood. Or, or the internet, you love your internet, you should turn your phones off, unless you're taking notes or looking at the Bible. You love the internet, you love sports, <clears throat> your job, the prestige of your positions in life. You love your friends, your leisure time, your possessions, your family. What would they say that you love if they just followed you around all the time? What would they say you love? Because you know, you know what you love by what you do, but sometimes we say, oh yeah, I love God. But if you are actually challenged by that, like really, or is there any evidence you love God? Maybe you don't. Maybe what you love is coming to church. Maybe you just love the way Hawkins looks when he preaches. Maybe you just love the way I make you laugh sometimes. Even though it's not funny you laugh because you think I think it's funny. But actually I say things that I know is not funny just to see if you'll laugh because then I can laugh at you when you're laughing at stuff that's not funny. See, there you go, you just did it then. You see, sometimes it's not God we love. And sometimes our love is so conditional. You know, if things go well. You know what it says about good old Job? It says of Job that, that you know, there's a reason, Job chapter one, there's a reason that Job loved you. God, you did something. So he said, if you hadn't done this, why do you think Job loves you? Why do you think Job follows you? Why do you think he's devoted to you? And so, God gave the devil permission to strip everything from him, but guess what? Job did love God. Job was devoted to God. Job believed God, and Job stayed faithful to God. You see, love sometimes is a concept far from, in our world, far from a biblical one, because uh, love's not just in emotional terms. It's not like a boyfriend love, and some people approach God that way. Love is a doing word, an action word. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, or you will follow after that which I have taught. It requires a commitment, a fact, sacrifice, a faithfulness. And someone said, nothing hurts like love. Nothing causes you to hurt so much pain as love. Every parent knows that, that loves love the child. Nothing can hurt so much as love. But loving God is no different. It, it, it'll be painful at times. It just is. In 1 John 4, 19, the Bible says we love because he first loved us. Did you know that? Did you know that God reached down to love us and that before you were likable and while you still were a sinner, God loved you. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. That God loves you just the way you are. And that's the hardest point of faith to believe. That's the number one hard thing. Well, I can accept God loves everyone, but no, I'm telling you, put your name there. God so loved James that he gave his only son. God loves you. That's the point at where faith begins to believe God for other things. And we love him because he first loved us. That's the first thing, is to believe he loves you. To believe the truth that God gave his son for you. That will cause you to love him. 
And it's, it's, you know, love is a deep-seated orientation of your life towards someone else. It involves your whole being. It's a, it involves deciding to put an, another person's needs before your own, just like a parent does. Now, God doesn't have any needs, but we need him. And just like a good parent, God wants us to learn what it is to put others before ourselves, and, and uh, to help him and to be a part of his kingdom and a part of his program. Like a mother that brings a child into the kitchen and teaches them how to cook. They don't need their help, but they want them to grow and they want to be with them. They want to have a relationship with them. And so God wants to use you by whispering and having a relationship with you to do great things. You can, I can even begin to tell you every week and almost every day that God will drop a thought into my mind and I'll pick the phone up and I'll call someone and I'll say something and they will say, oh my goodness, uh, this just happened because the Holy Spirit leading me. <clears throat> this past week, one of our young ladies had to take their baby. They'd misdiagnosed and had to take their baby to the hospital and God dropped that person on my heart and I texted, hey, I'm praying for y'all, thinking about y'all, appreciate you. The text came back, pray for right now because I'm taking my baby to the hospital to be checked because of oxygen level. That's all, that wasn't just some happenstance. That was because God dropped that person's thought in my head. And God wants to use you because he loves you and he wants to partner with you. He wants you to know him and know his voice and love him as he loves you. He wants a relationship. That's why God gave his son Jesus to remove sin so you can be in right relationship with him and walk with him and do things in the supernatural realm and the realm of the kingdom of God and not just an earthly realm and the realm of humanity of an organ organized religious institution that has no God in it. Amen. And it's easy to make that that way. The first chore for us, all the laws fulfilling this one commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love, it restrains you from doing evil and constrains you or motivates you to do good. That's what the Bible teaches. And the only way you get that love is by God by spending time with God. The second thing, not only it's not just an emotion, but it requires spending time with God. It demands interaction and communication and investment of time. You can imagine a friend who comes to you complaining about his girlfriend. He explains their relationship just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And you say, well, how long have you been going out? And what are your conversations like? And your friend says, oh, we don't actually go out. We don't really talk with each other. And many Christians talk about, I don't have a relationship with God. I don't know how to hear God's voice, but they don't spend time. They don't spend time in, in, his, in his word, in his truth. They don't spend time listening. They don't spend time worshiping. They don't spend time praying. They're too busy loving too many things. Let me tell you something. You, you can't get God's love to love God in your heart and get God's love in your heart when too many other things are in your heart. When you love all these other things, that crowds out your ability to love God. You get that? Yeah. You, you got too many other things you love, and so there's no room to love God. He, he wants to be first in your life, and you gotta spend time with him. And, um, and of course, the next thing is love comes from God's grace. You, you, don't, you can't muster the love. You can't go, you know, this, this is a struggle that I have. It's like, I know I'm supposed to love God. Come on, James loves God. Love God. Why do you act like that? Why do you do that? Why do you, you know, come on, love God. And you just kind of self-talk yourself in the love. You, you can't do it. It's the work of God's grace. He comes inside. He does something to change your heart. And, 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 and also realizing God's grace and mercy. Look at Luke 7, 49. Mark it down if you're taking notes. It says, those that are forgiven much will love much. When you realize how much you've been forgiven, you realize you're a sinner. You know, Chad Towers, you're a sinner. You're not that bad a sinner, but you're a sinner. And God has forgiven you, and God has forgiven me. So we got a lot to be thankful for. And who are we to withhold forgiveness to anyone else? See, when you love another, you love God. When Jesus said, if you give a drink of water in my name, you've done it unto me. You see, if we are thankful for all we've been forgiven for, that's gonna make you love God. Look what he's given you. Look what he's forgiven you. Look that he's given Jesus. And so, it, it, you know, just remembering, stir up the remembrance of all that he's done. You know, John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. 
See, he promises that if we will follow him and we will obey him and we will put our eyes fixed on Jesus, that he's going to put love in our hearts. He's going to abide with us. He's going to help us love him. That We need God to help us love him. Romans 5.5, 5, one of Pete Davidson's favorite verses, he used to call the Holy Spirit the warm mayonnaise of God. I love that. Romans 5, 5, our late Pete Davidson, he's quote this scripture, and this is the NIV, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. How did that love get into your heart? By the Holy Spirit. He poured his love by his spirit into your heart. You're, the way you love your family, the way you love others, the way you love people that are lost, the way you love other believers, the way you love God, God's spirit pours that into your heart. You can't do it apart from God by his spirit. Now, some of you want Jesus to be here. You think it'd be so cool for Jesus to be here, but he said, it's good that I go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. And if he comes, he will abide in you and he'll guide you into all truth. And he will convict you or convince you of that which is right, righteousness, and the, that there's a judgment of God and, that, and, 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 uh, and of sin. He will help you turn uh, from, to God and what, what is true. I got, I got that messed up just a little bit, but that's okay. We'll just move on. So it, I, didn't, I didn't really mess up the Bible, but I messed up just quoting that exactly. Galatians 4, 6 says this. It says, he also writes, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. You see, that's, that's loving God, don't you? A, a godly father, a father that loves his kids the way God wants him to, it's irresistible. It's the picture of God being a father. And I'm, so sadly enough, there are fathers who are just so captured by self and sin that they don't know that, and so that's a bad analogy for some people. But guess what? God. God wants you to love him like you love a father only deeper. And he loves you so deeply. He put his spirit in you. Your spirit of his son is in you so that you see and know God as Abba Father. You know, so, so it's our advantage that Jesus has sent his spirit to us. And so the second thing is that the spirit of God helps us to love God. And the next thing is when we learn to spend time, we learn to love others by spending time with their friends. We will spend time with God's people. See, many Christians effectively say to Jesus, I love you, but I really don't like your bride. I don't like the church. I don't like other Christians. And by their indifference and their lack of commitment to a local expression of the church, they're declaring that they're bankrupt of the true God, of the Spirit of God, of the Word of God that pours love into our hearts. You see, if, if I love someone I'm going to love the people they run with. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, and if they're running with people that I'm not going to love before long, that's going to break up. That's going to cause a problem. And I'm just telling you right now that, that um, that's the beautiful thing about a church of the body of Christ, that we're blood brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ's blood has cleansed us, and we are family, forever family. This is not just temporary. So you better get over it and forgive somebody because you're going to go into heaven and be called in Jesus' office, and you're going to be confronted. And you may not even get there if you hold on to that unforgiveness. It seems like to me the Bible might be saying that. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. But see... We can't love God properly without loving his church. That's the thing. We must love his church. So love requires a deep knowledge and understanding. And I skipped that one. I, maybe I did. I want to I just talk one thing about that. We got all of these up there. But I just, I just want to talk a little bit about that people that, that are detestable, unlikable, unlovable. If you know them enough, you'll love them. Because the problem is, is we don't know how did they get like that. What happened? And we know their story. We know how messed up they are. I don't care how detestable they are in our culture. If you understand where they, how they got that, you can love them past their sin. That's what Jesus did. That's what God did. And then he offers help to take them out of their sin and forgive their sin and change their heart. See, a long time ago, someone told me that. They told me, if you really know someone well enough, if you know them deep enough, there's no one that God won't put love in your heart because you understand and you're compassionate of how they got there. Think of the most detestable things that happen. It's like if you know the story of Hitler, God could put love in your heart. How did he get to be where he was? I'm not gonna tell the story, but there is a story. 
So we need God's spirit, we need God's word, we need God's church, we need to understand it takes commitment, it takes sacrifice, spending time with God, getting things out of our life that we love too much because we don't love God enough. It requires getting to God, know God all the way. For instance, just let me help you with this a little bit. If you see God as a weakling, and you see yourself struggling along as some pathetic little believer in this God, then, you know, how do you love that God? But if you see God, what the Bible says, and Jesus in the New Testament has declared everything that God has declared in the Old, it's confirmed in Jesus as being the same, that he is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he's omnipresent, he's present everywhere, he knows everything, he's omniscient, that he is, all, that he is a, a God of love, a perfect love, of perfect wisdom. And you know, when you go, he is a holy God. You go down all the characteristics of God, and you don't, you're not looking at some pathetic person. There's no way you don't love this God. And when you study the word and the names of God and the power of God and the truth of who God is, you're going to love him and you're going to love Jesus who is exactly as God, who does not change and who is the, the very expression of God, the Bible says. In Colossians 2, 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So 100% there. So that's what I'm asking. I'm going to close with this, this verse, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, 39. And, and this verse basically cuts to the quick, really. And it says this in Matthew 10. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, how can you love anything more than your mother and father? It's not talking, you know, how you love God and how you love your mother and father is different. You understand that? But what he's saying is, if you don't love God enough that if it requires you choosing God over your parents, then you don't, you're not worthy of him. That's what he's saying. He's not saying don't love your parents or like, like you know, how do you measure? Like, because it goes in another one of the gospels that says if you don't love your children, if you love children more than God, you're not worthy. If you love your wife more than God, you're not worthy. If you love your life more than God, you're not worthy. It's talking about in comparison that you have to say God is first and foremost. And here's the problem. How, we don't love God like we should because we're like the rich man who has everything and there's no seeking, there's no desire, there's no need. And so you just live your life apart from God and your desire, your seeking is not after God. Your dependence is not upon God. You're not trusting God. You don't have a desire to really know God or to love God because every, your life is so full of everything else. There's so many other loves in your life. You know, I, don't, I say I love the Green Bay Packers. Why? Because their fans are loyal even when they lose. And the Dallas Cowboys, their new owner fired Tom Landry, and I'm still bitter about it. Right before his last year of coaching. I mean, remember him. Greatest man of integrity, Christian man, is a great Cowboy fan. That, that owner still owns it. Fired him after he said, I'm only going to coach one more year. I was wrong, Mr. Jones. And that's why you can't win Super Bowls anymore. <laughs> you were God's chosen team. <laughs> why? Well, I don't even think that's funny. You guys are twisted. No, I'm just saying, you, we love too much stuff. We, yeah, you, you got too, much thing, too many things to love, you don't love that we don't love God enough. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves sports more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves money more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their computer and the internet and their smartphone more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone that loves things that they own more than me is not worthy of me. Wait a minute, it didn't say all that, that was me. But it does say, and anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, whoever finds his life will lose it. He's not talking about physical death, he's talking about putting God's life and purpose before your own, to lay down your selfishness. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The last verse, verse 42 in Matthew 10 says, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, I'll tell you the truth, he will not lose his reward. Because loving your neighbor and loving others is the very heart of God. And you can't love God without his spirit and his truth and knowing God being poured into your heart, the knowledge of God, the fullness of 
of God in you, and you can't love Christians that way without that, and you surely can't love the sinners or those that are despicable or those that are unlikable and those that are doing things that are horrible. You know, so we react to things in the news, and we just want to, we just hate that person. We just want to kill that person. We go, can you believe they did that? And we will, and we, we just have this hate, but God's heart breaks, and he cries, and he prays, and Jesus makes intercession. He's crying out for every soul, because until you die, you have a chance of forgiveness, and God is reaching, and he keeps on reaching, and as a church, we are to love God with all of our heart first. We are to love one another, because by this, he, people the world know we're his disciples by how we love one another as Christians, and we are to love the lost. We are to love them, not condemn them. Love them, show them Jesus. Love them, show them truth. That's our call. And what we need is a Holy Spirit more. We need the love that changes everything. It changes the church, it changes the family, it changes the person, it changes your goals, it changes everything. God's love comes into your heart. And what we need is more, more, more of God and less, less, less of ourselves. Will you bow your head? Close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself, do I love God? Would I be found guilty of loving God? Or would I be found guilty of loving my friends? Would I be found guilty of loving sports or music or entertainment or movies or the internet? Would I be found guilty of loving many other things? Many people in America now have made family their God. That's why Jesus brought it up. You love family more than you love God. See, you love your family differently and you love them with all your heart but you never let them take the place of worship and honor where your life and devotion lies. It's God first. And in doing so, you've loved your family properly. You're here today and you say, I need to love God more. I need His help. I want His Spirit to fill me more with His love. Would you lift your hand? Lift it up. You're here today and you say, I need the, Jesus to give me that gift of, of salvation and forgiveness. I need Jesus to forgive me, come into my heart and change me. Lift your hand. You need Jesus. You just say, I, I, I've done it before, but I really need Jesus. I see hands all over. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. If that's you, lift your hand and say, here I am. And how many of you say, I'm going to change what I love, and I'm going to pour my love toward God, and I'm going to do it even now. 